Let me start with an unfortunate fact. Agriculture is bad for the climate. Let me say that again. The way we grow and produce food is one of the major reasons why our planet is in the climate crisis it is today. Rice, cows, fertilizer, deforestation, taken together, nearly one-third of all greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture. At the same time, climate change is also really bad for agriculture. It's already causing dramatic oscillations in weather patterns. More floods, more droughts, more pandemics, and not just pandemics for people, but pandemics for plants that could ultimately cause widespread famine. Both of these problems, ag emissions and crop loss due to climate, are just going to get worse as climate change intensifies, and the world adds close to 2 billion more people in the next 25 years. How are we going to feed 10 billion people without destroying our planet? What if we could farm without any net greenhouse gas emissions? Truly a net zero farm. A world where we could grow all the food that we need, even in the face of a changing climate, and be part of the global climate solution. I'm here today to talk to you about CRISPR and how it can help do exactly that. CRISPR is the genome editing tool that scientists use to cut and paste DNA, just like you would edit a sentence in a document. It's, uh, in short, it allows you to change the function of living cells. I became the executive director of the Innovative Genomics Institute, the IGI, in 2020, the same year that our founder, Jennifer Doudna, won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for her pioneering work in CRISPR. That's right. Let's go, Jennifer. I was drawn to the IGI as a place where CRISPR could be applied to help improve the lives of nearly every person in the world, to help create a sustainable future. But before I tell you about CRISPR for climate, let me tell you a little bit about myself and how I came to be here. My last job was to be the director of the biotech office at a place called DARPA. DARPA is the Department of Defense's high-risk, high-reward high research funding agency, and it's considered one of the premier science and technology innovation hubs in the world. The internet, GPS, self-driving cars, you guessed it, all had their origins at DARPA. <clears throat> I had a uh, program manager that used to say at DARPA, if you don't invent the internet, you get a B. <laughs> and he was kind of right, because DARPA is showing that technology can truly transform the world. But what about biotechnology? Can the same be said about its potential to change the world? Well, my office had a pretty good track record there, too. We were early investors in vaccines based on messenger RNA. We discovered some of the first monoclonal antibodies to be used to treat COVID. And we developed neural implants that allowed a quadriplegic to fist bump President Obama just by thinking about moving his own arm. <laughs> I know. Or an amputee that had a prosthetic that had sensors in the hands so that when he lifted his daughter, he could actually feel her embrace. That one gets me. So clearly, biotech can change the lives of people as well. But after 20 years of working for the Department of Defense, it was clear to me that climate change just wasn't squarely in their mission space. So about two and a half years ago, I picked up, moved from Washington, D.C., and came out here to Berkeley and joined forces with Jennifer Doudna to try to change humanity's climate trajectory using CRISPR. It's a technology that was discovered just a little over 10 years ago but has already spurred a biotech revolution. CRISPR is a system that combines a precise targeting molecule called guide RNA with a, a molecular scissor called Cas9. And when they're taken together, it allows CRISPR to be able to zero in on a specific DNA sequence and cut it to inactivate a gene, or to paste in a DNA sequence to do things like uh, correct a disease-causing mutation, or even uh, change the trait of human cells, plant cells, and even bacterial cells. CRISPR has raced out of the lab to make a real-world impact. There are human clinical trials going on to develop treatments for things like cancer, previously incurable diseases like sickle cell, <clears throat> and even blindness. 
although it's still relatively early for many of these treatments, it's clear there's more and more da uh, data suggesting that CRISPR can be used safely and effectively. And many, many agree because there are billions of dollars being put into startups trying to develop these cures. But what really excites me is the fact that CRISPR is not just limited to new medicines. DNA is in all living organisms. It's the code of life. So why not unlock CRISPR to help fight other problems facing society? At the IGI, we have a team of renowned scientists trying to do just that, to use CRISPR in many different ways to help pause or even reverse climate change. Our plan is to enable a net zero farm, and it breaks it down into three areas of impact. The first, we're going to use CRISPR to help produce crops that are resilient to, to uh, uh, climate disasters, helping to improve food security. We're also going to use CRISPR to help eliminate agricultural emissions like methane, nitrous oxide from things like rice cultivation and burping cows and fertilizer use. And at the same time, we're also going to develop uh, and use CRISPR to help enhance plants and microbes' natural ability to absorb carbon from the atmosphere. We're going to essentially create biotechnologies that can help remove gigatons of atmospheric carbon and put it back in agricultural soils. The work to improve food security is already underway. Our scientists at the IGI can already edit over 30 different crops. Rice, wheat, but, uh, <laughs> broccoli, sunflowers, tomatoes. We're even trying to uh, develop crops that can uh, persist against emerging pathogens by knocking out disease susceptibility genes, or create drought-tolerant crops by reducing the number of pores that are, that are on the, the water-losing pores on their leaves. We're even trying to save the banana and chocolate from emerging pathogens. But now, these approaches are going to help us uh, have higher yields and reduce crop losses and be able to allow farmers uh, to grow more on less land. But to really help create a net zero farm, we're going to have to reduce agricultural emissions. And surprisingly, those emissions, the most of them don't come from things like tractor use and burning fuels. They actually come from something called the microbiome. It's a community of tiny little microorganisms that grow all over the planet, but importantly for agriculture, they grow in the gut of cows and in soils. And they release some of the most potent greenhouse gases in the world. The worst of these emitters are livestock. It's res responsible for almost 15% of all global greenhouse gas emissions, just from cows and livestock. <clears throat> Most of that is from a gas called methane, which has resulted in about 30% of global temperature rises since pre-industrial times. And that methane is emitted from microbes that are in the gut of the cow. So our collaborators at UC Davis have already developed a feed supplement that alters that microbiome and reduces the methane output from cows by up to 80%. So, but it's not all the complete solution because it's pretty expensive and it also is difficult to distribute around the world. So we're developing a CRISPR solution that can be given to nearly every cow when it's born to alter its microbiome and set that animal on a lifetime course of reduced emissions. Rice is also part of the problem. It's 10% of all agricultural emissions. The community of microbes that live on and around the roots of rice are great because they support the growth of the rice, but they're really bad because they also produce methane. So IGI scientists are actually doing the most complete study that's ever been performed to study the rice plant and how the microbes grow and, and uh, produce methane around those plants. The goal of that work will be able to provide a roadmap of genes in plants and microbes so we can go in and use CRISPR to help turn off those emissions. And then finally, fertilizer use results in 20% of agricultural emissions, this time from a gas called nitrous oxide. But again, guess where it comes from? The soil microbes, okay? When you use fertilizer, those microbes release nitrous oxide. IGI scientists are working uh, to try to edit crops and microbes so they work together to use nitrogen more efficiently, reducing emissions, but also cutting costs for farmers who won't have to buy as much fertilizer as well. This brings me to my uh, plan to help remove atmospheric carbon and return it to ag soils. 
And we think it's a perfect place to put carbon because those soils have already lost close to 500 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalents since humans have started farming. That's over 10 times the number of human emissions every year. What if we could use CRISPR to help put this carbon back? It would help achieve global climate goals, but it would also let farmers help work in marginal and underutilized lands and convert those into more fertile soils, helping to reduce the need for deforestation. It's a win-win-win. So, the only problem is that putting carbon back in soil is actually really hard. On the one hand, you've got plants and microbes that use photosynthesis to remove 120 gigatons of carbon a year from the atmosphere. But almost all of that carbon gets released right back out into the atmosphere through natural biodegradation processes. It's called the carbon cycle, and it's how Earth has um, you know, sustained life for billions of years. But human emissions have unbalanced this cycle. So we're turning to giant uh, carbon dioxide removal machines that kind of try to suck carbon out of the, out of the atmosphere. But they're pretty energy intensive, and they're difficult to scale quickly. Whereas plants and microbes, we think, are part of the solution to put it back in soil, put carbon back in soil. They're already, agriculture's already scaled across the globe, and it's rejuvenated every year, making change possible very quickly. So our plan is to enhance photosynthesis, to capture more carbon, to be able to edit crops, to be able to create roots that grow deeper and more dense, to push carbon into the soil, and then ultimately work with that soil microbiome to be able to keep that carbon and, stay, and have it stay put in the, in the soil. Now, even with all that carbon that photosynthesis absorbs every year, it's actually a pretty inefficient process. But IGI, thinks we, think, uh, IGI scientists think we can edit those crops to improve both the way plants absorb light energy and the way that they build biomass to help improve the efficiency of photosynthesis by up to 30%. That's more carbon for food and more carbon uh, to store. Now, some of that extra carbon we want to put into plant roots. And there's already, an, uh, uh, to be able to edit them to be deeper and more dense. We have a, a member of an IGI member at UC Davis that's already identified genes that cause roots to grow deeper in rice, as shown here. Um, and deeper carbon usually stays put uh, in, in, in soil longer. Now, I've talked to you about photosynthesis, how it can absorb carbon from the atmosphere, how we're going to use roots to get the carbon into soil, but if we don't work with the soil microorganisms, that carbon's just going to go right back into the atmosphere. So, we're going to use CRISPR to try to direct the flow of that biological carbon into stable, long-term forms of organic and mineral complexes in soil. And IGI members already identified a lot of these stable forms of carbon, so now all we have to do is edit crops and microbes to be able to try to channel that carbon into those pathways. Now, all of this work leverages the IGI public impact team. It's a team dedicated to ensuring safe, ethical, and affordable solutions to climate. Now, that team operates with full transparency. They work right side by side with our scientists. And they also talk with farmers and regulators, like places like the EPA and USDA, and they also work closely with a global nonprofit that supplies seeds to farmers in low- and middle-income countries. Now, most CRISPR-edited crops aren't considered GMOs by, the world, by most of the regulators around the world. So we truly believe there's a way to be able to scale these technologies to have a global impact. So you can see why I'm excited to be here at Berkeley and, and at IGI. It's helping me realize my vision of where global climate emission goals are met by changing the way that we grow food. And it comes along with so many co-benefits. We don't just reduce emissions and reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. We improve food security. We make more fertile soils. We hopefully will do less deforestation. And the most important part is that we'll empower farmers in low- and middle-income countries with accessible and affordable technolo technological solutions. This is the world that I want to live in. It's the world I want my children to live in. And it's not only possible, it's probable. Everything I've talked about today is based on real science that's happening either at the IGI or other labs around the world. So with this, I'll leave you with one word, hope. It's easy to lose hope when it comes to climate change. Trust me, I've been one of those that's fallen victim to that. But together, we can make a difference. And scientific innovation can make a difference. And together, we can help build a more sustainable future. So thank you so much. Thanks.